caring. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I um, am in recovery and have been since 2015 and really looking forward to sharing this presentation with you all. Um, it's a big part of my life and what I do. So thank you. All right, so real quick, we're going to go over some vocabulary since this is kind of an introductory level um, presentation, we wanna go over some things. So gender identity, right in front of you, you will all see the gender bred person. This is a really good visualization on how to see um, gender identity versus sexual orientation versus biological sex, which even then is not anywhere close to binary. Humans are weird, genetics are weird. Um, not really a box that people fit in all the time. Uh, so gender identity, I like to think of it as your brain, how you feel, which has nothing to do with what I call the bits you are born with. So your primary or secondary sex characteristics. Um, for pronouns, you have pretty standard, um, he, she, he, him, his, she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. There are, however, a myriad of pronouns out there and included in the slide is a link where you can, as the URL suggests, practice with pronouns. They have a whole bunch of different pronouns that you can try out. Um, we also have some uh, examples on how to use those pronouns. So for me, if I had a bagel, uh, he has a bagel, the bagel is his, or the bagel belongs to him. If my sister, Shannon, uh, had a bagel, she has a bagel, bagel is hers, or the bagel belongs to her. If Ashley had a bagel, they have a bagel, the bagel belongs to them, and the bagel is theirs. Pretty, pretty standard stuff. Uh, Ashley, do you have anything to add to the gender bread? Uh, Ashton pretty well encapsulated it. And as he said, there, you know, there's biological sex, which is also not a binary um, and has very little to do with identity and expression. Uh, you may know somebody who identifies, like myself, identify as non-binary. Non However, my clothing style tends to be very feminine. That doesn't take away from my identity. It's simply my expression. And Ashley really did touch on a good touch on a good point there. There is a big difference between gender identity um, and how you express yourself. So for myself personally, I identify as a trans man. I choose to dress um, very traditionally masculine in type of clothing, but very feminine in the patterns that I wear. I'm a very Ferdinand the Bull type of person. I love flowers. So <laughs> you will always find me wearing flower print things. But again, regardless of what the person wears, it has no weight on how that person might identify their gender. So it's always important, which we will get to later, to ask. And so we um, make sure we're respecting everyone. Ash, you wanna grab this one? I don't know if they're frozen or not. I'm sorry, I believe I am frozen. I'm in the oh, middle of wait. texting you about that. You have unfrozen, we got gotcha. you but my screen hasn't unfrozen. There we go. Oh. All right. Uh, so queer representation in substance use. Uh, around 30% of folks who identify in the queer community can experience addiction. Um, there's absolutely a strong correlation between how their families react to them coming out or expressing themselves. Uh, that, that is tied strongly with having substance use or mental health problems. Uh, there's also a very targeted marketing strategy from a lot of uh, legal or alcohol organizations, alcohol businesses, um, as well as just a, a subculture uh, within the community of using substances. Um, there aren't very many inpatient programs that specialize in queer recovery, and there is a whole lot of discrimination, um, particularly, 
particularly towards uh, queer people of color. Uh, so there's definitely um, an overwhelming need for support for queer folk who are looking for it with substance use. And even for those who aren't looking for it yet because maybe they don't know yet that they, that they need that assistance. I'm gonna turn it back over to Ashton because I'm not sure where my, uh, I'm not connecting well right now. All right, so like Ashley said, um, queer identifying folks are up against quite a bit um, when it comes to substance use. Um, you'll also notice, so when, you, when one thinks of a queer space, a space designated for queer people to gather and to be social and to be in a place where they feel safe for themselves. The first thing you think of is a gay bar that is a very substance focused environment where part of participating in that space, it's a general understanding that you participate in substance use and engaging in that, in that way isn't necessarily the healthiest for queer folks in recovery or queer folks that um, are experiencing addiction. Um, there aren't a lot of queer coffee shops or queer libraries or queer gyms. We do live in, and I'll explain this term later, a cis and heterocentric um, world, meaning that systemically the world is kind of geared to the benefit of cisgender identifying folks. So when their brain matches their bits um, and it's not, really, it's not really set up for people that don't identify that way. Um, here I will go to, oh, I'll also touch on support real quick. So when it comes to support, you have your average 12 steps, your smart recovery and other mutual aid groups. However, they tend to um, be very, while they do say spiritual, sometimes they do have a religious twinge to them. And historically speaking, um, most religions haven't been the greatest for <laughs> queer identifying folks, um, which does provide quite a bit of gatekeeping for people to access those pathways. Um, and being that queer folks do make up a smaller percentage of population, it's sometimes more difficult to find those very specific queer focused mutual aid spaces. Um, also, when it comes to treatment, there are not a lot of places that provide queer specific treatment. So let's say, let's say in a treatment setting, you go in, you can be housed with women or you can be housed with men. So what happens if there is someone that identifies as neither, someone that is transgender? How do we safely have those people in treatment so they are being affirmed in who they are while also making sure it is safe for them to be engaging in that space? And now my computer is also frozen. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second so I can get back to my slides. Oh, the joys of technology. There it is, all right. Give me a second just to share the screen. Oh, geez. Ah, here we are, all right. Queer representation in mental health. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Ashton Daly. I'm a person living with um, mental health issues and mental illness. Um, yeah, I'm doing okay with it. So when it comes to discrimination, discrimination on a systemic level and on a social level does bring a lot of people into a place where they have PTSD. They're experiencing depression. They're experiencing anxiety, some of the most common ones, because of the oppression that they face in the world. On top of that, when you intersect um, queer folks of color, queer disabled folks, those are just more layers on top. Um, but unfortunately, we live in a world where people can be denied housing. They can be denied health care in some ways. They can be denied or removed from their place of employment because of their gender identity or sexual identity, sexual orientation. 
um, and that does have some impacts on a person's mental health. Uh, when it comes to a diagnosis, there is an extreme lack of um, care for queer folks. And unfortunately, there is a lot of gatekeeping. And when I say gatekeeping, I mean, um, there are certain hoops that queer folks have to jump through in order to um, live authentically. So in my own experience, I am on something called hormone replacement therapy. I take testosterone to kind of nudge out the estrogen that my body produces. Um, and to do that, I had to be diagnosed with the DSM-5 as having gender identity dysphoria. So that, that is a diagnosis I have to have without whatever other diagnosis is I have, diagnoses that I have, that is a diagnosis I have to have in order for my insurance to cover uh, the medication that I need to live authentically. And that can stop me from doing all sorts of things. It, um, under the previous administration, it prevented me from serving in the military. It could prevent me, it could cost more, it has costed more um, for me to live because insurance wasn't quite covering as much as I wanted it to, as much as other insurance agencies had covered before. Um, also with transgender and non-binary folks like in treatment for substance use disorders, treatment in mental health facilities, there's often um, housing split between men and women. And oftentimes um, people don't identify that way or people aren't necessarily safe in those situations. I know for myself personally, I would feel very uncomfortable if I was housed with a bunch of cisgendered men being a trans man, but I know I would be very uncomfortable being housed with cisgendered women, as well as my paperwork, my medical paperwork, having a big old F for female on top. Uh, if I had a nickel for every time I was called Miss Daly, and they look down at their keyboard and they look at me and the look of sheer terror that's on their face and the look of sheer terror that's on my face, I would have quite a few nickels. Uh, I would like to have no nickels in that situation. Um, to kind of bring it to a more serious note, um, when it comes to suicide and suicide attempts, 40%, like four zero, 40% 40 of trans identifying people have attempted suicide by the time they were 25. 40%, that's almost half. That's a lot. So if you know two trans folks, one of them has probably attempted to take their own life because of the systemic discrimination that they face. Um, and other LGBT identifying folks are four times likely than their cis or heterosexual counterparts to attempt suicide. Um, also, when it comes to support, queer identifying individuals are more likely to have um, traumatic relationships because of things they had gone through with their parents, caregivers, communities. So it's harder to build that system of trust. Um, and often, we, as queer identifying folks, have to rely on a chosen family, then sometimes our biological families or communities that we were raised in. But it's quite difficult to create that family for yourself, especially when you are a young person, still kind of stuck in a community, unable to go somewhere else on your own. And unfortunately, um, a lot of queer identifying youth are kicked out of their homes because of how they identify. All right, so what is this? It's a yield sign. How do yield signs work? So you're driving up and someone's got a yield sign. That means they have to stop or pause rather and make sure that all cars on the road can exist there safely. It is the job of the person with the yield sign in order to slow down and make sure that they remain safe. They make sure that the other passengers and the other drivers remain safe, but it's still their duty to make sure that they obey that yield sign. And now we're gonna talk about yield moments. So what is a yield moment? A yield moment is a situation where before you're interacting with a person and you kind of take that pause. So I kind of mentioned a situation earlier. So if I go into a doctor's office, um, all of my health insurance says female because I, I have all the bits and pieces 
and part of um, taking care of my body medically is to make sure that my healthcare providers know what they're working with. Um, so a yield moment that would happen with them was them looking, seeing Ashton Daly with an F on the top of the page, walking up to me, seeing me who presents as a man, uh, and then they probably have that moment of pause. So what, what do they do? What do they do? Um, but part of this is also a learning curve. So how do you engage with someone when you might not know their pronouns, when they present in a very gender ambiguous way, when their name and the assigned um, sex on the top of their paperwork doesn't necessarily match the person in front of you? Um, are you afraid to engage? What happens when you misgender someone and how to um, come back from that? So we're going to start with learning curve. And Ashley, I don't know how good your connection is. Feel free to interrupt at any point in time because I'm just going to kind of take the reins over here until you um, are connected enough to kind of hop in because I know you hold a lot of expertise in this field. Uh, so a learning curve. What happens with you? What happens if you mess up in front of a person? What happens if you hear other people mess up or misgender someone? We're gonna assume for the sake of these situations, it all of these um, misgenderings are unintentional. And since we are in the helping profession, um, we're going to assume that everyone means the best in all of these situations. Um, and how to, when it comes to learning curve, truly embrace it, truly embrace that not everyone's gonna be perfect out the gate and that's okay. Um, if you're afraid to engage, if the person, like you said, expresses in a way that you're unfamiliar with, um, or if your documents don't match how that person is expressing. And misgendering, if you misgender someone, if someone else misgenders a person, and um, what limitations, we'll have a discussion later, what limitations you might come across within your agency when it comes to documentation, when it comes to making sure that these queer identifying folks get the care that helps them in whatever situation they might be in, but is also gender and sexuality affirming so that we're caring for the whole person because you can't care for a person if you can't respect the pronouns. All right, how to move past yield moments. Ask the person, just ask them. I have been asked plenty of times, hey, you mentioned that you're trans, because I talk about it quite, quite a bit. Uh, hey, you mentioned you're trans. What are your pronouns? What name do you use? So let's say um, there is a generally feminine name, a big F on the screen, and you see me walk in. Go, hi, my name is so-and-so. My pronouns are this, that, and a third. What's your name? What are your pronouns? It opens that space for you to kind of make it a safe place for them to share their name and their pronouns. And you can kind of write it on the top of their page. I have plenty of times before my legal name change went through, um, written on the top of doctor's office, um, little sign-in sheets, goes by this name, uses he, him, his pronouns and really start it and circle it so people would see it because there's nothing worse than having that, uh, the nurse walks out the door, so-and-so, and you're like, hello, yes, hi. This is, I think I'm, I think I'm here enough that you all should be able to hear me. I hope uh, the joys of having two different offices set up is that sometimes my connection isn't great. Um, but to comment on this and to further prove Ashton's point, like if you have a person coming into your office and you are creating a space where even if not a single employee is a queer person, but everybody introduce, introduces themselves with their name and their pronouns, you are going to make a space where someone can come in and share who they really are with you which really allows for work to be done. Um, and, and it will be clear too, if there's some kind of pause for them. So, you know, asking somebody, hey, you know, 
you know, what's your name? What are your pronouns? I, my name's Ashley. I use they, them. And then seeing how they react to that and allowing them space to realize that they can be open with you can be really um, a good moment that allows you to build on from there. Um, I don't want to move too far ahead, but it also says like, just because they're out to you does not mean they're out to everyone. This is a, a really good opportunity also to be like, I recently had somebody introduce themselves to me with one name and they seem to not really like that name. So, well, what, what name do you want me to call you? Is it okay if I use that name in public or is it just when it's you and me? Um, same with pronouns. And then it creates a bond of trust that they may not have experienced before when seeking help. And it allows you to build a connection that creates trust within it that's that's all i wanted to say for that one honestly i i couldn't i couldn't have said it better myself ashley you're fantastic i'm so glad we present this together um i know outside of my outside of my position with youth voices matter i also work in uh, behavioral health residential care separately and we work with 12 to 18 year olds. So right, right in that prime, those prime formative years with young folks. Um, and whenever I meet a new kid, I say, hey, my name is Ashton. I go by he, him, his pronouns. What's your name? And they tell me their name. All right. Do I want me to call you anything different? No? Okay. What pronouns do you use? They'll share. All right. Can I use those pronouns in front of other staff? Can I use those pronouns in front of other peers? Can I write those pronouns down in the log so other staff know? And it's okay for the young person to say, you can say it in front of other peers, but I don't want you to say it in front of other staff. You can write it in the log, but maybe not in front of other peers. And um, it's always helpful to have a little notepad with you <laughs> just so you can write all this down. Um, because there are quite a few layers to build that trust that Ashley was talking about. Um, another one is, um, so what would you, we'll kind of go, we'll, we'll skip around a bit. So what would you like me to do um, if I hear a staff member or if we're in a situation where a staff member uses another name? Would you like me to correct them? Would you like me to leave it alone? Would you like me to meet with you later to debrief about that situation? Because sometimes, and I know personally, I've been in this situation myself, where um, sometimes I found it easier to just move past a situation and not address it because of the emotional labor it takes to educate someone that has um, inadvertently or not disrespected you. And sometimes it's just easier to take that path of least resistance and kind of move on with your day. Ashley, I saw I you unmuted. Yes, I want to add to that. Um, it's, it's also when we're coming at this from a position of being the adults in a situation or being um, the people with power in a situation, it's, it's really important to clarify with the person you're working with, like, they may not feel comfortable asking you to correct people, but a really great way around this, like Ashton said, is if I hear someone misgender you, would you like me to do something about it and see what they say and how they react to that? For, for me, I'm also a full-time student. Um, and I try to reach out to my professors every semester and say, hey, here are my pronouns. Please don't refer to me uh, as she, her. It makes me really uncomfortable. I don't like it. Those aren't my pronouns. Um, if another student misgenders me in the middle of a lecture, it may not feel appropriate for me to interrupt an entire class of peers learning to correct somebody, but it would 100% be appropriate for the professor to pause and say, that person's pronouns are they, them, please use those, and then moving forward from there. So there's 
there's an opportunity again to just build trust by being an adult who will go to bat for them for me <laughs> so that so that we don't have to do the emotional labor that ashton was talking about educating people can be so exhausting um and having somebody else willing to step up for that um and a quick note so when it comes when it comes to gender identity more so than um having a different sexual identity uh, gender identity is something where people have to come out multiple times sometimes every minute sometimes every hour sometimes every day so it is day after day after day of someone trying to make a space for them in this world i know so i i do have i have quite a bit of privilege when it comes to the trans community i am white i'm able-bodied um i generally present as heterosexual um i'm masculine i and i present i pass so when i say pass it means if you see me walking down the street you probably think i'm a cisgender man so i i hold a lot of privilege in that way where i don't necessarily have to come out in every single situation i have i am afforded the opportunity to feel safe in most situations because I am that white, cis passing, straight passing man. Oftentimes, other people are not afforded that. Oftentimes, other people are not afforded that. And having to come out every single day is extremely tiring. It's like um, if you tell someone, hi, I like my coffee with cream and sugar. And every single day, they bring you the wrong cup of coffee. And it is their job to bring you your coffee. And every day you have to remind them, hey, cream and sugar, cream and sugar. Probably gonna get really annoyed with that. <laughs> it's very irritating. Um, it's even more irritating when it's who you are and yourself. Coffee is something you can dump down the drain and get another cup yourself. When it comes to you yourself, how one lives authentically in their own skin in this world, that's deeper. Than that. Uh, so moving on to, oops, I misgendered someone. What do you do? It happens. It happens to everyone. I have even misgendered someone. Me, the one of the most trans people on the block, have misgendered someone. What do you do? Quick, apologize, correct yourself, and move on. But also practice in private on your own because this is work you have to put in. So if someone misgendered me, use she, her pronouns for me, they would say, oh, sorry, he, and then move on with the conversation. It is quick, it is painless, it is respectful, and you don't have to dwell on it. And it stays comfortable for most everyone. Um, oftentimes, something I found in my lived experience is people will want to continue to apologize, and that just makes the situation uncomfortable, uh, because then oftentimes the queer person who was just misgendered has to then console the person that misgendered them. So it turns into like a weird, a weird flipped situation that isn't necessarily healthy or respectful. Uh, so. Yeah, just quick, easy, apologize, correct, move on, and then practice. So when I first came out as trans, um, I told my very Irish Catholic grandparents um, and my grandmother, bless her, got it down, got my pronouns and name down pat in six months. In six months, this old Irish Catholic woman got it down in six months and I, I called her and I asked her about it because we we talk quite often and I said Grammy I'm like how did how did you and Poppy do it and she said every morning I would wake up and I'd say Ashton 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 and then I'd go on with my day and a that was the most precious thing I've ever heard in my life and b she put in the work she made it she made it very intentional that every day she would practice my name because she loves me and it's cute, but she put it, she put in the work and it was really that easy. And sooner or later, 
it became habit. I love that story. Every time you share it, it makes my heart burst a little bit. One of the important things that is kind of unspoken in that story is that at no point did Ashton's Irish Catholic grandparents ask him to explain anything about it. They embraced it as part of who he is. He did and have some questions, but they were very respectful. <laughs> yes. People will always have questions. They always have questions. <laughs> and being respectful about it is always the way to go about it. But one of the things that I think is really important just as a general human is in terms of respecting each other, we don't have to get it. It doesn't have to be something that we have a deep understanding of for us to respect where another person is coming from. Um, and I think it's one of the most beautiful parts about being in the helping profession is that we, none of us judge where somebody else is coming from. We just embrace it as part of who they are. And identity and pronouns are a really big part of that. Um, so not necessarily having a full understanding of it doesn't mean that you can't be um, an amazing support in somebody's life who respects them and shows them that you care. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. All right. Being an ally. Very easy. And I know it's uncomfortable because it does, um, it does put you out there. But if you don't know, ask. It's okay not to know. Not everyone knows everything in this world. It's just, if you don't know, ask. If you think you know, ask. Just in general, ask. When you're introducing someone, like Ashley said before, whenever you meet someone, ask them. Hey, what's your name and pronouns? Easy peasy. Um, and share your pronouns, really create that space where a person can just step into it and they don't have to forage their way through. So put your pronouns in your email signatures, put on your business cards. During introductions, when you introduce yourself in a meeting space, say, hey, my name is so-and-so, my pronouns are so-and-so. Put it in your Zoom name. <laughs> Very easy, because then when people look at your square and start to talk to you, they can be reminded of your pronouns. And again, it opens that space. Uh, don't make assumptions. We all know the saying, and I'm not going to say it. Don't make assumptions. Um, respect boundaries. So if a young person shares their pronouns with you and just wants it to stay within that trusted relationship, that's okay. It's always important to respect that. Um, and step up. Like Ashley was talking about with that power difference, always step up. Oftentimes when it comes to young folks, we are the adults in the room. It is our job to make sure that that space is safe for everyone. And part of that involves stepping up. And yeah, it's gonna be a little uncomfy at first, but I promise you'll get a hang of it. <laughs> um, but also stay in your lane. If someone says, hey, I don't want my pronouns to be shared in this space, don't share them in that space. Just make sure you stay in your lane and always ask the person um, where they're comfortable being out in that space with their name and pronouns. And a discussion. So let's talk about some of your yield moments, everyone. And I will stop sharing. Ooh, I will stop sharing screen for a second because we all come from very different backgrounds. Um, I'm assuming we're all in the helping profession since we're all connected with families together. So what types of situations have you all been in? And how can Ashley and I, based off of our professional lived experience, help? What you got? Don't everyone talk at once. <laughs> Wow. 
while we're letting everybody think up amazing questions, I'm very happy to see Core Center here. <laughs> it's very nice to see you all. <laughs> all right. Also, while everyone's thinking, I'll talk about a, um, a situation I was in, just a discussion I had. It didn't even turn into a situation, a quick discussion I had. So um, at this residential care facility, I am also the lifeguard over the summers. So I was sitting, um, oh, and we had a question. All right, so someone said, we recently had a middle school teacher who asked students their pronouns in a large class setting verbally, and we had some upset calls from parents. What are your thoughts? This is an excellent, this is an excellent question. Um, I have a very, personally, I have a very um, radical approach. So first, it's always important to um, make sure that in a school, it is safe for the students. Parents are parents, parents have their opinions, and that's all well and good, but a school is an institution made for students. It is a place to mold young minds. Um, I actually had a similar situation at my high school that I grew up in, they had a bit of conflict over Pride Month. Um, and what we did was we kind of checked in with the school because again, it's important to stay in our lane, especially in institutions of care, uh, checked in with the school and saw what they were gonna do about it and offer support. Say, hey, we understand that this is your lane. This is your institution. Uh, we are also, people with lived experience. Um, we also are of the firm belief that people deserve the respect and dignity of learning, especially our young folks, in a safe and um, what's, it's not validating. Um, trying to think of the word. I'm gonna go with validating because I can't think of the word. Uh, students deserve to be in a place that, affirming, a safe and affirming way because young people can't learn if they're not being considered um, who they are authentically. Uh, so definitely check with the institution. And I, since I do have some experience working with this, if, and I'll put um, Ashley's and my contact information up later, but I definitely wanna learn more about the situation if you'd be willing to talk uh, more offline about it, but definitely first things first, check with the institution, see what their thoughts are, and then um, sometimes move forward in an independent of school administrators type of way. Uh, because like I said, at the end of the day, students are what come first and students deserve to live and learn in a um, safe environment, regardless of their gender identity or sexual orientation. And just to add to that in general, um, right now, it, uh, 40 years ago was the right time, but now is, the, is not too late for all institutions to start making statements about how we treat people within our agencies. Um, Lynn says, how to support parents respectfully when their young person comes out to them or when the parents find out on their own. Mm. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, to finish up what I was going to say about Lara's post is that like, like Ashton said, like we support all of our students, um, not just our cisgender ones. Um, just like we, support all of our students regardless of where their parents stand or where they stand politically. That's why we're here to support them. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ashton for thoughts on Lynn's post and then maybe I'll have some follow-up. All right, so the first thing that hops up to me or pops up to me is staying in your lane. So while a parent might be telling you this about their child, um, the young person didn't necessarily tell you themselves and having ownership over who you share yourself with is an important part of growing up. It does give you, it does give you ownership over the information about yourselves. So it's important to, while you can tuck that information in, the back, in your back pocket, so if and hopefully when they do come out to you, you can be like, okay, cool, here are some resources that I happen to have on file, ah, ta-da. 
Um, but in supporting parents, um, it all depends on the situation. I know um, Partnership to End Addiction actually has a very comprehensive guide on um, substance use disorders and parenting. I don't have the link off the top of my head, but I will look for it right now. And I actually helped um, consult in creating that page. So while it not might be the best because I can only speak from my own lived experience, it did have a trans person's input, which is often better than most. <laughs> um, but here, Ashley, do you wanna take the... Yeah, I would, I would also, excuse me, I would also say like, to some degree it, I'm curious what way these parents are feeling if these are mm -hmm. specific parents, because again, our, for, for me in, in my position at Tompkins Cortland, if, if a student is coming out and their parent is calling me and saying, well, I don't know what to do. My kid's gay and that's not right. And they want to be a different gender, like all of that. Like my job is to support and protect the student. And if they're a minor, the concern for their safety is like my first concern. And if a parent is not being safe with their kid, like that's, that's something that should be addressed maybe a little bit differently than if a parent is coming to you and saying like, I don't know what to do because I've never had a kid that isn't straight or I don't know what to do with my kid's gender feelings and I wanna support them. Like there's a big difference there. And um, at the risk of sounding a little radicalized, if they're not supportive of their kid, then I'm not gonna try to be respectful. <laughs> I'm going to protect the, the kid. Um, without losing my job. <laughs> yeah, and um, so an important point there, not, I, I, like to, I like to remain optimistic. So I always, I always wish to assume the best in situations because not everyone knows everything. So sometimes parents want to be supportive of their child, but they might not know how. Um, but in situations where parents might, might not be super supportive, um, it's okay to, be that supportive space for that young person. Uh, not when, again, I can only speak from my own experience when I was a young person and I came out, I've come out many different times in my life. Um, when I first came out with um, my sexuality at the ripe old age of 14, 15, um, I wasn't out to my family for a very long time. I was only out to my friends and in school. Um, and I felt safe there. Um, and it was nice to be supported by my friends and the staff and some teachers at my school. It kind of, um, it kind of encouraged me to remain connected with my peers and with the teachers and staff at my school. So really, uh, worst comes to worst if their parents aren't supportive providing that young person with information, with resources, and providing them with that safe space where they can live authentically and safely. All right, um, it is 51, and I know Alex does have a survey for y'all, but while he's doing that, I'm gonna throw up our Contact Us page. Please send us emails. I definitely want to hear about any situations y'all might have going on and how, how we can help. Oh, and it's back to page one. Oh, geez. I may have to scoot a couple minutes early as well, but I do want to thank everybody for coming and being willing to ask questions and listen while we talk. Appreciate that. Awesome. So thank you, Ashton. Thank you, Ashley. Um, you know, you really did a great job today. Um, and thank you for coming. Um, does anyone have any final questions, comments, concerns, um, anything for Ashton or Ashley before we wrap up today? Seeing lots of thank yous in the chat. I don't know if you see that. Lots of thank yous, lots, lots of those. I can't see it, but thank you. Oh, also, um, this presentation is again, a 101. 
it barely skims the surface. It is your what you need to know to be respectful off the bat. If you want to know more, do some research or um, I am someone that is comfortable being asked those questions. So feel free to contact me with whatever questions you might have. As am I. Awesome, awesome. Um, so their contact information is on the screen and in the chat. Also, if everyone could take a moment in the chat, I've put a link up um, for an evaluation for today. Um, just let us know how we did. It's, it's, uh, it's really useful for us. I'm, I'm sure you guys are all aware, you know, how useful these evaluations are to an agency. Uh, so we really appreciate you guys filling them out. If you said it's uh, pretty brief, the link is in the chat. Um, and I'll stick around a couple moments in case anybody needs any assistance filling it out or anything. Um, but once it's filled out, I think, um, I think we're all wrapped up. And also while you're doing that, big thank you to Families Together for putting on this series. Um, I always love talking to people and they always uh, make sure to invite me to stuff and provide, provide the opportunity for um, people to talk on a platform about very important issues. So thumbs up to Families Together and to Alex. Uh, thumbs up to you too, too, man. Thumbs up back. It's our pleasure to have you. All right, well, unless anyone has any questions,